Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the word pogrom. The word pogrom is being abused. Pogrom has a specific meaning. When you misuse it, its meaning is cheapened. Of late, I'm hearing pogrom way too often and misused almost all the time. The best example was when the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema, announced that the attack on Jews in her city after the Maccabi Tel Aviv soccer match against Ajax on November 7th was not a pogrom. In fact, the attack was specifically against Israeli fans. All over downtown Amsterdam, even inside their hotels and down the halls of their hotels. The Israeli fans traveled to Amsterdam from Israel. They are diehard soccer enthusiasts. The mayor said that it was not a pogrom, yet at the end of that fateful night, 10 Jews were brutally hurt. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sent two 747s with search teams and medical teams to first find and then evacuate Israelis safely back to Israel. The mayor apologized for using the word pogrom in the first place. She explained that the word is now being used by Israeli leaders and Dutch politicians to discriminate against Muslims, particularly from Morocco, in her city of Amsterdam. How incredibly absurd. This was her apology, I'm quoting, boys on scooters crisscrossed the city in search of Israeli soccer fans. It was a hit and run. I understand very well that this brings back the memory of pogroms. The mayor then adds, I saw the word pogrom has turned very political into propaganda. In fact, the government of Israel speaks about a Palestinian pogrom on the streets of Amsterdam. She did not stop there. She continued and condemned Dutch politicians by saying, they quote, use the word pogrom essentially in order to discriminate against Muslims, Moroccan Muslim residents. I didn't mean for that and I don't want that, unquote. The mayor of Amsterdam went from absurd to ridiculous. We could discuss how many Jews need to be attacked to qualify the event as a pogrom, but to then invert on its head and reinterpret the entire set of events as a pogrom against Muslims living in Amsterdam is playing fast and fancy with the term, with truth and with history. Every year I reread Friedrich Nietzsche's inspiring essay, The Use and Abuse of History. The title encapsulates Nietzsche's thesis, that people use history for their rhetorical ends, and as a result, they abuse history. Nietzsche's thesis is perfect when applied to today's language of hyperbole. If, for example, every massacre or murder is a holocaust, then the meaning of the systematic murder of six million Jews by Hitler and the Nazis and their accomplices, the Holocaust, has little meaning. The same is the case with regard to the word pogrom. The word is first found in English in 1882. It comes from the Russian pogromit, to destroy. From there, the word immediately jumps into Yiddish as pogrom. The word was used to describe the murderous riots against the Jews, mostly in the Russian Pale of Settlement between the years 1881 and 1883, where Jews were forced to live. The best way to define the pogrom is a violent and even murderous mob attack on a specific group, most notably Jews. There have been famous pogroms, the results of which changed history. In 1903 in Kishnev, which was then in the Russian government of Bessarabia, on April 19th through the 21st, the Jews of Kishinev experienced a, br a brutal riot, rape, murder, and burning of their homes and community. All this happened while the Tsar's army surrounded the city, preventing the Jews from escaping. Eventually, the army stopped, and they stepped in and stopped the pogrom. The news of the horrific murderous pogrom spread throughout Eastern Europe. It stimulated a massive exodus of Jews from Europe, most of them came to the United States. In the 11 years between the Kishnev pogrom in 1903 and the start of World War I in 1914, 1 1.5 million Jews escaped Europe 
for freedom in the United States. To this day, it was the largest single immigration of Jews to the United States of America. In all of US history, the Jews from Tel Aviv, who went to the Netherlands to cheer for their soccer team, knew full well that there was some degree of danger. They knew there would be anti-Jewish vitriol, but riots and violence against them? That was an entirely different level of hatred. What happened in Amsterdam was a horrific, vicious, brutal, cruel, targeted, pre-planned attack on Jews. Despite the mayor's apology and protestations, it was a modern day pogrom, the Amsterdam pogrom of 2024. Coming up next, points of view. Both of our columns today are from Ynet and both deal with the decision of the ICC. This first column is by Matan Gutman. It was published on November 21st, 2024. It's entitled, This is what the ICC's international arrest warrant means for Netanyahu. Subtitled analysis, following the international court's decision, any visit planned by the prime minister in one of its member states could lead to his arrest. Further action possible. As is typical, the subtitle of the Wynet piece encapsulates the entire column. This is how Goodman begins. The ICC's issuing of international arrest warrants against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former Defense Minister Yoav Gallant over allegations of their responsibility for alleged war crimes in the Gaza Strip raises several questions regarding jurisdiction, enforcement, international implications, and practical consequences. Is Israel subject to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, the ICC? Israel is not a signatory to the Rome Statute, which established the ICC. However, under the statute, if an individual commits a war crime within the territory of a state party, the ICC has jurisdiction over them even if they're a foreign national. Now, this is a very important question, and the Palestinians understood this, which is why they joined and signed the Rome Statute in 2014 as a member state. Now, remember, the Palestinians have observer status in the United Nations. They're not a member state, but they can join committees as if they are a state. Goodman continues. The Palestinians joined the statute in 2014 as a member state, using this as the basis to extend its application to Israelis. In February 2021, the ICC's pre-trial division ruled by a majority that the ICC prosecutor has the authority to investigate alleged war crimes in Palestinian authorities, territories beyond the Green Line, the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Goodman now explains how an arrest warrant can be issued. He explains it, that it is clearly outlined in Article 58 of the Rome Statute. He writes, and the restaurant may be issued under the following conditions outlined by the Article 58 in the Rome Statute itself. And now he goes on to list exactly what they are. Now, Gutman explains that Putin has the arrest warrant issued against him and that the ICC has never issued one against a democratic leader. He writes, who has previously faced ICC arrest warrants? Netanyahu and Gallant joined the notorious club of dictators and war criminals subject to ICC warrants, such as Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir, Libyan General Mahmoud al wafali and Joseph Kony, leader of Uganda's Lord's Resistance Army, which abducted tens of thousands of children to serve as soldiers and sex slaves. Russia's Vladimir Putin has recently had an arrest warrant issued against him. Kupman asks why warrants have not been issued against Hamas leaders. He writes, why haven't similar warrants been issued against Hamas leaders for war crimes? The ICC has issued a warrant only against Mohammed Dif, who was reportedly killed despite no official confirmation. Equating Hamas terrorists with Israeli officials is seen as a moral and legal travesty, a serious error by the ICC prosecutor and a profound ethical low point. Now I have to explain there are 123 signatories to the Rome Statute and Gutman explains that Bibi and Gallant cannot travel safely to any one of those 123. He writes, this means that any travel by Netanyahu and Gallant to a Rome Statute member state could potentially expose them to arrest and extradition to the ICC. 
However, not all member states cooperate with the ICC. For example, in 2015, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir attended an African Union summit in South Africa and was allowed to leave the country despite an outstanding arrest warrant of the ICC. Gutman concludes that there will be future challenges to Israel. He writes in conclusion, in their ruling on Thursday, the judges clarified that they weren't addressing Israel's potential defenses, such as complementarity, which would be discussed at later stages. This underscores the importance for Israel to continue bolstering its legal defenses via independent internal investigations to prepare for the next phases of the proceedings. Thank you, Matan Gutman, for clearly explaining the ICC's ruling and its lacking. Next up is a column by Ben Yamini. It was published on Ynet on November 22, 2024. It's also about the ICC ruling. Yamini takes the ICC to task on the issue. The column is entitled, Dark Nations Dominate UN. ICC grants victory to terror over Israel. Subtitled opinion, the ICC's decision clearly shows the free world's decline as it condemns Israel for fighting terror while ignoring Hamas's crimes against humanity committed on October 7th. This is how Ben Dror Yamini begins. On October 7th, Hamas carried out the most severe pogrom since World War II. This is a terrorist organization whose ideology is thoroughly Nazi-like, an organization whose spokespeople talk about annihilating all Jews, sometimes extending this to Christians as well. Its leaders openly speak of world domination to establish a dark empire. This organization launched the deadliest terror attack since 9-11, resulting in the murder of 1,200 people. Women were raped, babies and children were burned. Now Ben Yamini draws a parallel between October 7th and 9-11. He shows how the U.S. and the world responded. He writes, how would the free world respond to such a program? Well, we know the answer. After September 11th terror attacks, the free world initiated a war on terror. In war as in war. Innocent people were killed. Entire cities were destroyed. Millions became refugees. It was clear that this cancer had to be uprooted in distant lands, even though the threat was thousands of miles away from London, Washington, Paris, or Ottawa. As a result of the war on terror, 38 million people were displaced. Approximately 4.6 million people died directly or indirectly due to these wars. About 7.6 million children continued to suffer from malnutrition. According to UN studies presented in 2022, around 90% of those killed in the wars in recent decades have been innocent civilians. Ben Yamini asks, why is there a different standard for Israel? Israel is fighting the same battle, but is condemned, he writes. But when it comes to Israel, the standard changes. Every country in the world is allowed to act except Israel, a terrorist organization whose leaders declare their intent to continue killing Jews, scores a major victory at the International Criminal Court, the ICC, an institution established precisely to combat entities driven by genocidal racist ideologies. Does the presence of a murderous enemy justify a harsh response by a sovereign state? There's no need for complex theories, only facts. When the U.S. killed over 100,000 innocent Japanese civilians in Tokyo bombings, who was at fault the U.S.? or Japan. Now Ben Yamini begins to conclude. He shows the hypocrisy and also the absurdity of how the ICC embraces the criminal, not the defender. He writes, the answers are clear until it comes to Israel. After all, as long as a country's judicial system addresses violations on its own, the ICC is barred from intervening under the principle of complementarity. We need internal international mobilization of Jews and non-Jews, of anyone with reason, justice, common sense, and humanity in their hearts. This absurd reality where the aggressor celebrates while the defender faces arrest warrants isn't only a threat to Israel, it's a threat to the free world. 
The battle in Gaza and in Lebanon isn't over, and its outcome remains uncertain. The international campaign for justice and truth on campuses and in global tribunals is just beginning, and it's no less critical. Thank you, Ben Dror Yamini, an excellent defense of Israel and the castigation of the truly flawed ICC. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you five cartoons today. The first two cartoons are just a sampling of dozens that were published about the banana as art that was sold at auction at Sotheby's for $6.3 million to a Chinese young man who then publicly ate the banana. I walked in the synagogue just about morning and I'm grabbing a few different rabbinic collections off the shelf. During the downtime in synagogue, I learn and look up answers to questions that have been asked of me or have troubled me overnight. As I turn around, I'm surrounded by a few men asking me to explain the banana. I literally went through the sugya, the issue, like it was a Talmudic challenge from the Gemara itself. How this banana with gray duct tape ended up being a cultural phenomenon, world cultural phenomenon, not just in the United States. This first cartoon depicts the comparison of the famous Belgian artist René Magritte, who painted this pipe. It's called Treachery of Art, and he was 30 when he painted it. The caption in French on the painting reads, this is not a pipe. For those who do not understand, Magritte was famous for painting normal things in unusual settings, forcing us to think more clearly about what is ordinary. Of course it is not a pipe. It is a painting of a pipe. And the difference is significant. The cartoonist, and most of the world, is looking at the banana with the duct tape and asking, is that art? That's the question. Next up is another funny depiction of the banana. The caption reads, true, a duct taped banana was sold for $6.2 million at Sotheby's auction. Security is watching a monkey in a suit looking at the banana and one security guard says to the other, keep an eye on that guy, as if to say he's going to eat the banana maybe. The next few cartoons are about the ICC, a theme we've developed. This cartoon is entitled ICC World Divided, Justice, Gaza, War, Netanyahu. The ICC is holding up the scales of justice, which seem even-handed. Olive trees are on both sides. The cartoonist is normally very anti-Israel. In this case, he's depicting an even-handed response to the ICC decision. Next up is an Israeli tank facing off against the ICC court and the justices sitting on the law book. This style is much more typical of the European condemnation of Israel, as we see. This is from London. The cartoon is called ICC Facing IDF. Next up is a cartoon of Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. The scales of justice are his eyes, and they're upside down. The cartoonist is saying that justice was turned upside down. The cartoon is entitled Netanyahu Wanted War Criminal, ICJ Justice. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. I want to do a round robin on today's responses to the ICC decision. Here it goes. International Criminal Court Prosecutor Karim Khan urged ICC members as well as non-members to cooperate with the arrest warrants the court issued earlier on Thursday against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former Defense Minister Yoav Gallant and Hamas leader Mohamed Dif. Great Britain and France the British and French governments indicated on Friday that the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu could be arrested on an international criminal court arrest warrant if he traveled to the United Kingdom or to France. Germany. Berlin will carefully examine the international criminal court's arrest warrants for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his former defense chief, but will not take further steps until a visit to Germany is planned. Cyprus, which has close ties with Israel, considers arrest warrants issued by the International Criminal Court as binding in principle. 
Hungary. Prime Minister Viktor Orban said that he would invite Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to visit Hungary, saying he would guarantee that the International Criminal Court arrest warrant against Netanyahu would, quote, not be observed, unquote. Holland. The Dutch foreign minister's trip to Israel has been postponed because of this. Italy. Italy said that they would have to arrest Prime Minister Netanyahu if he came to the country. Canada. Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau responded to questions about his view of the ICC decision to issue arrest warrants for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Quote, everyone has to abide by international law, Trudeau said. He added that Canada will abide by all the regulations and rulings of the international court. That was Canada. Now for the U.S. The United States. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said, and I'm quoting here, the United States fundamentally rejects court's decision to issue arrest warrants for senior Israeli officials. We remain deeply concerned by the prosecutor's rush to seek arrest warrants and troubling process errors that led to this decision. Kirby said, it is clear to the United States that the court has no jurisdiction in this matter. Czechia, Jan Bartoszek condemned the ICC decision. He said, today at a time when the world public is alarmed by the rise of anti-Semitism, when world politicians are condemning its violent manifestations, as in the recent attack on Jews in the streets of Amsterdam, we are witnessing an absolute unprecedented decision that de facto legalizes anti-Semitism on a global level. He posted this on social media. Moreover, the decision of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, to issue arrest warrants for the Prime Minister Netanyahu and former Defense Minister Gallant is an unprecedented legal act as it concerns the democratically elected Prime Minister of a sovereign country. The ICC has thus contributed to the overall atmosphere of uncertainty in the current world order. It equates terrorists with legally elected state leaders, which in practical terms can only embolden terrorist movements around the world. And finally, Argentina. Argentina's president, Javier Millet, you should recognize the name because he gave it to Artoa recently that I showed you, of Argentina. He expresses his profound disagreement with the recent decision of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, to issue arrest warrants against the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and former Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. This resolution ignores Israel's legitimate right to defend itself against constant attacks by terrorists, organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Israel faces brutal aggression, inhumane hostage-taking, and the indiscriminate launching of attacks against its population. Criminalizing the legitimate defense of a nation while ignoring those atrocities is an act that distorts the spirit of international justice. Argentina stands in solidarity with Israel, reaffirms its right to protect its people, and demands the immediate release of all hostages. What an unbelievable response by Argentina. Unbelievable. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that this video, sung by Arye Leib Horowitz, is, uses the famous Simon and Garfunkel song, The Sounds of Silence, that addresses the theme of that no one really cares. In this case, Horowitz changes the lyrics of the song, as well as the title, to The Sounds of Sirens. It's very powerful. It's about, obviously, October 7th. Hello, Israel, my old friend I've come to pray for you again With joy so many came that day to dance To 
Terror came to kill and rob the chance Oh, the horrors that were planted in my brain Still remain within the sound of sirens Restless mothers cry alone Will their babies come back home? Rockets fired at every stone A land defended by the Iron Dome Lives were stolen When they came to take our girls and boys Bloodstained toys And the sound of sirens Courageous men called off for war Four hundred thousand, maybe more Still people talking of peace treaties The world is watching without looking And opinions from a desk in a country Nowhere near But they don't hear The chilling sound of sirens They all condemn and say, hold on down our guns and she'd be gone The bravest men and women every day They fight so we can live another day These words fall silent on the world's deafness No one cares for the sound Stand as one United cause they know they've won Cause the one above is on our side Call upon his name and he'll provide When I'm Yisrael's prayer The sounds of sirens ring way too loud and way too often in Israel. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Mm-hmm.